and then I'm uh, I'm gonna start recording on um, QuickTime, and you can start recording now there as well. Oh, it's so funny. Just kidding. Umu, do you have um, headphones with a mic? Any no, I don't have headphones with a mic. That's okay. on QuickTime and we are recording on Zoom and woo, okay we're doing it um all right uh <laughs> my cat just attacked my other cat should I close this window? I'm going to regret it if I don't close this window. Can you hear me okay right now? I can. Can you hear me okay? I can. I'm trying to figure out if the mic is close enough to me, but I think it is. That's a good place for it. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to introduce you and then, and then we'll get started. Cool. Okay. Today I'm talking to Umu Silla, who uses she and they pronouns. They're a queer immigrant from Senegal and Guinea who utilizes therapy and their license to practice therapy in their practice. Yes. Which I'm very excited for you to explain, Umu. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, it's me, Umu. Hi, good to see <laughs> you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for asking me to be here. Very exciting. Um, Yes. So Mia, because I asked them to do so, did everything that they could to avoid saying therapist. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Yes. And why, 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 did, why did Mia do that for me? Because I have recently been trying to figure out a way to like decenter myself in the world as a, like my, my role as a therapist um and figure out other languaging for like what I do and and what I offer and like what value that I that I add to the world that like being a therapist is not really like allotted me the fluidity and mm. um agency that I would like for sure and um my colonized education is not the center of my practice and I don't want it to be anymore so I'm an Umu doing very cool things in the world right now until I figure out what to call myself. I love that you just refer to yourself as an Umu. Yes. I've been look like I've been with all like my gender exploration lately where I've arrived is that I am a gender. This yes. is a gender. Yes, you're existing. That's what this so here we are. Right, right. So I'm curious what about um 
just, I mean, you and I have talked a little bit about this, but I would love for everyone else to get a window into what about um, being a therapist is so limiting in that way. Mm, recently, I did a post on my cute little Instagram um, mm-hmm. about my path to licensure. I just got licensed uh, in April um, of 2021 after working through the pandemic. The pandemic is where I got the majority of the hours for wow. my license because people really, you know, it was wild time for everybody. And so I answered the call of the profession, right? And I showed up and I did a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hours, um, all in the state of New York, right? Because mm-hmm. that's where my license is. And that's part of like the reason why I'm trying to like disassociate myself almost um from my license and my like role as a therapist and figure out what else to do with like therapy being a skill set that I have Mm -hmm. um but yeah it was like burnt out and I think that the current structure of licensure in almost like pushes people towards that like they it ensures that people are going to burn out and that's exactly what happened to me especially with like the pandemic being layered on top of it um and then like also outside of that right like the structure adding to burnout and like the way that like the job market looks um I can only practice in the state of New York if I'm a therapist right there's not a lot of like parity that happens across states or across like borders um which makes it really like difficult for me to like work with aligned clients that live outside of New York State um before telehealth was a really big thing like I could only work with people that lived in like New York City right right? and so like now that telehealth is a little bit of more of a like a integrated thing in the the field now I can do like you know all over New York State but those are two of the main reasons yeah (laughs) they're huge huge. yeah I mean it's always seemed so weird to me that when you're a therapist you basically like you can't move pretty much yeah 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 yeah. it makes it really difficult to move around um and there's like some like mm, interesting things that you can do to like work around that the moving but it's not easy and and not everybody has that information yeah so we were talking a moment ago about the restrictions that are sort of prescribed by like the systems in which labor occurs um, and what limits labor uh, and um, money and capitalism and stuff. And I'm curious when you're thinking about moving out of being a therapist and into like you know, you're at a moment, a transitional moment, that's like, the world is open Ah! to you. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so I'm curious, like, what that reimagining labor looks like for you. It has been like a really wild thing to to go through, right? Like, I am the first of, of anyone, I think, in my generation, in my in my family, right to reimagine what labor looks like there's like one path that you do like you just work really hard you strive for excellence you you do good by yourself and your peoples and then you just you just die like like who cares about (laughs) passion who cares about interest who cares about fulfillment who cares about like rest and anything like that like you're just you're you're doing labor and that's that's that um and I think with like this reimagining of like what my kinds of labor looks like right and not only just like this work labor thing like just like emotional labor as well um and physical labor and all of that like it's been really wild like transformative like scary confusing um it's been lots of like start stops while I try to figure out like what fits for me um and it's because I'm also like using my brain in a different way that I've, than I've been trained to by like the dominant culture and the world. Um, and so it's been, um, it felt, it's felt like isolating sometimes, but then also like, it's been nice to talk to folks and, and hear their ideas about like what 
kinds of things they've done that have worked for them as they've taken their own versions of like reimagining labor. So that's been cool. You know, one of the things that, and I told you this, this one of the things that like struck me about your website when you reached out to me and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to talk to this person was <laughs> your contact page that was like, I'll get to you when I get to you. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I have so much to learn about boundaries and rest from this person. Like that just, that to me was like such an indicator of who you are and like how you want to work in the world. Yeah. And it was, it's in, in such a small, in one sentence, I thought it communicated so much about how you want to live and how you want that reflected in the work that you do. No, for sure. For sure. And that that's even putting that sentence was like, really like, I was a little nervous to do yeah. right? because then like, what if that cuts me off from opportunities? And like, what if, what if, what if people take offense to this? And like, what if I'm perceived as like, whatever. And I'm like, I actually am only concerned about how I navigate through the world. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's it. And what feels good and okay. And sometimes it feels a little like difficult to see an email and they're like, I want you to do this thing in two days and I've never met you and I don't give a fuck. Please Whoa. do this thing. And it's like, and then I'm not even getting paid for it. There's never a, 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 a money associated with those kinds of requests, right? It's just urgency, white supremacy, yes. urgency. And then the, the, the decision and desire for someone to offer you free labor. Right. The demand. The demand. And I don't like that. And I don't <laughs> want to participate in it. <laughs> you know, what's coming up for me is like, you just said that, um, that there was a concern that it would like cut you off from opportunities. And I've worked so hard over the last couple of years to, um, to like take that worry and instead of being like, don't worry about it, it's not true to be like, it is true. And that's a good thing. I'm so happy. I would love for those types of things to put um, concern into people's hearts and um, make them consider whether or not I'm the best fit for th the thing that yep. they want. I don't like that's misaligned because now you can clearly see what my values are. And so like make a decision. Right consent or don't <laughs> like it's cool you see what you see what's up I've given you some information yeah you can opt in or opt out and what I love about that statement is that it is such it's so indicative to me of the idea that um like boundaries being clear about your boundaries calls in the people that you want to be in relationship with and that you want to be in community with because the people who are offended by that can fuck off yeah I think that's you're cool happy about that right yeah I think that's so cool to say for sure yeah and then <laughs> the people who see it who it'll make the right people want to work with you more because you clearly respect yourself and your time and your energy and you I also do. know how to protect it yeah. and so many people are looking for guidance in how to do that for themselves yeah 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 and then if somebody sees that it's like possible to do it this way, they're like, okay, like, should I add this shit to my email tag? Like, <laughs> yep. what, what, what should I do? Like, how, how can I decrease? Cause I was dreading emails at one point during the pandemic. Like I had, I had so many emails that I would just leave unclicked for weeks. And it would be like, and, and by unclicked, I mean like I clicked it and looked at what it said and then marked it as unread. Right, right, right. Okay, for weeks. And it was because of this like urgency that people have around like, I've now sent you this thing, you have to look at it and respond to me. And it's like, I don't, I don't want to. And I, you don't know my capacity and that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That's something that I really struggle with in the work that I do in the entertainment industry because there's sort of this like, having no boundaries and no like work-life balance is sort of like a point of pride for a lot of people yeah and for sure, they, culture. right and they want you to answer your emails and be available at all times and recently Jiminika who's been on the show and who I work very closely with with my training company um she while we were in per we were getting dinner and she was like take your work email off your phone my body umu was like what the fuck? 
fuck are you trying to make me do? Like, it was so upset. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I recognized that. And I was like, well, I think that means that I probably need to do it. And I took my work email off my phone. Yeah. And what I've recognized over the last two weeks since I did that is that people do not email me as often as I thought. I get just as much done in correspondence if I check my email once in the morning and once in the afternoon. That's it. And there you have it. There you have it. And there you have it. What a lovely balance, right? Like, it, it, it didn't have to be the way that it was. And it was, it was like that for some time. And now it's not. And that's lovely. We change once we get information and see that things aren't working. Right, right. It, it has truly opened up so much space in my brain that I'm not just like constantly opening my phone and refreshing my email all the time. I talk about brain space with my clients all the, or with the mm -hmm. people that I see in the therapy yeah. room all the time, all the time. I'm like, your brain space is being inhabited. Like, like it's being affected by like systemic violence, by um, you trying to figure out how you're going to get your next meal, by uh, this childhood trauma that's popped up because you have a lot of free time now, mm -hmm. right? And freeing up brain space and like your relation to capitalism is a really great place to start. It's the most, it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. So how do you approach helping people free up their brain space? Uh, you kind of do like an inventory, I think. Like what, what has been passing around in your head as of recent? Like what's causing you the most distress? And usually people will talk about labor Mm. Mm -hmm. usually people will talk about labor and I think that like me conceptualizing um in like some ways uh the concerns that people bring up as labor has helped to interact with it in this like different way than I think is like again taught in my therapy program none of mm -hmm. what I do day to day in these sessions those people in that program taught me like this has been a lot of learning and unlearning that I did outside of the program. Anywho, <laughs> did you yeah. want to say something? Well, I was curious, um, like when you define labor for people, like how do you, how do you conceptualize it? Labor. So sometimes I'll say it as simply as like the things that you do that can tax the body. Depleting acts. Depleting acts, precisely, right? And so that can be relational labor. Um, that can be like labor at a job. That could be physical labor. That could be like mental labor, decision fatigue, you know, type of laborous stuff. Um, and so, yeah, like when thinking about like what types of labor are depleting you the most, we kind of figure out like, okay, these things are depleting you. How are they depleting you? Because I can't make an assumption about what these effects are, right? Like sometimes it could look like I'm I'm now depressed and and, and unable to do all of these things. Um, I feel paralyzed when I try to start and stop doing these things. And it's kind of like the effects of those things will look different on whomever you're talking to. Mm -hmm. um, and then once those things are like identified and the effects are identified, then we kind of figure out like, okay, what do we need to really do and usually in my work recently it's looked like uh doing education around like neurodiversity of the brain yeah education around like capacity um i've been like weaving in some like disability justice type stuff in sessions um like uh weaving in some like spoons theory Yes. Um, things and like the reason why you think you're lazy or the reason why you're exhausted is because of the current structures of like a lot of the systems that we have to interact with. Yes, 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 yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited that you're going to be in this program in August. <laughs> you know, it's so amazing to hear you say this because when I have been in talk therapy, um, what I have so often felt was missing was the education piece. Like I want tools, I want practice, I want skills, I want language, I want structures. Sure. And when I started training to be an intimacy coordinator, that's what I was learning. And I was like, where the fuck has this information been all this time? Yeah. 
and I'm not getting this in therapy. And I was going to my therapist and I was like, I want these things. And she was like, I feel like you want something from me that I can't offer you. And I, or, and then she also said, it sounds like you want like the fast track to the, the answer when I was asking about things like EMDR and hypnotherapy. And I was like, no, I want practical skills because I can talk to you all day about my life and my childhood, but it doesn't help me understand how to heal. And, you know, it was things like learning about polyvagal theory and learning about attachment theory, um, stress responses and brain science and gut science. Yep. Yep. All those things are the things that I, that have changed how I relate to other people and how I relate to myself. And those are the things that I now bring into my one-on-one practice with people. And there are, I spent so much of last year, like really, really scared that people were going to mistake me for a therapist. So I sent out this consent form that was like, I understand that Mia is not a therapist. Mia is not a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until therapists started taking my classes and therapists and healers and practitioners started wanting to work with me one-on-one that I was like, oh, well then clearly this is different because even they are looking for this information. Um, And now I don't worry about it so much because it's just totally different. So it's really cool to hear that you're like already bringing that stuff into the therapy space. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's really cool to hear that you're really conscious about being perceived as something that you are not. Yeah. Right. And and the way that you're practicing. Um, Because then I think like when folks aren't clear about like their roles and things like some really achy, achy things can happen for all folks involved. Um, But yeah, no, what you do and what therapists do is different for sure. Right. Right. And I remember you wanting to like talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to approach this stuff as an educator. And if the outcome is that it feels therapeutic to somebody, that's fantastic. Um, I feel like information is really empowering. Yes. And can change how you understand yourself. Agreed. And it's no surprise to me that that's therapeutic. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that's exactly why um I try to in my practice um when I'm a therapist like doing lots of like psychoeducation is what I call it right in in my in my field um Mm -hmm. I do lots of education whenever I can um in my sessions and it's like sometimes to my detriment because like sometimes that's just like my therapist logical part that pops up my Virgo brain and I like do lots of like intellectualizing and so sometimes that like is part of the part of the experience of how and why I'm teaching right but slash and um I think it's also just like really really important for folks to have this like information because it's not like anyone gives you a manual on how to like live your life when you're born and so like you don't know about like the fact that the the brain is going to do what the brain does and these neural pathways exist the way that they do because of these things and that we can learn some new stuff but it might take some time and it might be tough and difficult and scary um, and parts may be nervous, but those parts can be soothed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what else is coming up for me around this and especially around you the concept? Big inhale. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. I'm glad you noticed that. I did uh-huh. not know. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So segue, slight pivot. Um, there's this concept that I mull over a lot that is coming up in this conversation, which is this idea of self-consent. I have a a colleague who calls it um, being in consent with yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And I find that to be huge when it comes to labor and when it comes to burnout, because so often I'm the person violating my own boundaries. You know, I'm the person, I say, I don't check my email past 8 p.m. And then I'm the person checking my email past 8 p.m. No one is in my ear telling me that I have to do that. Um, Additionally, with like, you know, in my, in my personal life saying like, I don't want to do X, Y, or Z. And then I'm the one who ends up doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
telling people that I'm unavailable and then making space for them. Like I'm the person violating my own boundaries. And that is typically what's leading to me feeling under-resourced. Yes, um, Mm under-resourced. Majorly Mm under-resourced. And I've also been tying that in with the ways that I'm like shooting myself or coercing myself into doing stuff as, and that the, like the urgency piece is like, that's me, you know, like, yes, it's capitalism. Yes. It's all these other things, other things, but really the, the, you know, the person like standing over me being like wagging a finger is myself. A part of yourself. A part of myself. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really curious, like I talk about this in my work and I talk about this with clients and I've developed certain things to, to deal with this, but I'm really curious about how you think about it. I'd love to hear all of the things that you said. And while you were talking, uh, the word that just kept popping into my head was betrayal. Ooh. Like over and over again, I'm like, yeah, yeah. That's like lots of self-betrayal pops up when we're not... Um, able to like know and describe what our boundaries are and what are like firm lines of, of um, firm lines of, what am I looking for? We'll just say firm lines of boundaries. Firm mm-hmm. line of boundaries are, um, parts of us will get activated around that, right? Because we're, we're not like consenting, we're not honoring our needs, we're not doing all of these things. And sure, they're informed by all of these like systemic pieces, but we're kind of a part of us is really responsible for like learning how to interact with this and learning to identify when we're crossing our own boundaries or when we're in situations where our boundaries are being crossed. And so I think a big, big, big part of it is like number one, acknowledging that it's okay to be a person that has needs. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's like something that people, (laughs) people have a tough time with. Like, yes. oh shit, like I am a human being and I have needs and those needs deserved in the past and also deserve in the present to be met. And that's a really tough thing for people to wrangle with. And then it's like, number two, I have to tell people these needs. What? Mm-hmm. And around these needs, there's boundaries, right? And these needs and these boundaries are context-based and people-based and relational-based. And there's all of these like nuanced pieces Um, And so I think a big, big, big part of it with um, a lot of the folks that I see in the therapy room is like lots of practice, lots of practice of like identifying like what our boundaries are, identifying when we've allowed, or not when we've allowed, but like when our boundaries have been crossed and like what the context and, and situation around that was and practicing to do different things in the future once we've done like continued observation and like looking around of what's been happening right right okay so something that's coming up for me and this has been coming up over the last week with several different people is these um these values that we have that are somewhat outdated in my from my perspective Mm -hmm. things like duty honor (laughs) loyalty, obligation, those kinds of things. And the ways that as a result of those values and those value systems, we, we glorify people who are willing to exert themselves beyond their capacity for others. Yes. We celebrate them for that. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so part of supporting people in preventing burnout, part of supporting people in finding their limitations and stating their needs is, is undoing those entire structures that we've learned make us good people in others' eyes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. how does that, how does that land? So while you were talking about the first piece around like duty, honor, loyalty, I'm like, you know, in, in, in isolation, those words sound like sure. and dandy, right? Like those yeah. sound like great words, but <laughs> when we think about, <laughs> when we think about the ways that like consent and get um, affected around those things, or when we think about the ways that like 
capacity and context are kind of like rolled over because of those words specifically, that's when it gets really, really murky. Um, I think that like doing meaning making changes around those words is really, really important, right? Right. right. So like, okay, this is what I've learned that this, this type, this word or these kinds of words mean. What do I want it to mean? Because I think like we all have a duty to our community or we should, right? If we think about community and we think about communal care and like all of these things, but my duty to my community does not mean I need to violate my rights, my dignity, myself, my consent. When there's power that's like lingering over these words, right? And, and control lingering over these words, then like to hell with those words. <laughs> I don't give a fuck right. about them. That's really interesting. The idea of sort of like redefining these words so that they are more like, um, I'm thinking about the way that my friend Minachi, who was on the show, mm -hmm. um, like opened my mind to a new definition of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. We were, we were talking and they said something about like being in reciprocity with people. And I was like, well, I, I sort of bristle at the idea of reciprocity because I think that when I'm giving, if I'm truly giving from a place of like generosity and wanting to give, then I don't want to, I don't think that it is truly in consent to expect something in return or feel like I'm owed anything. Mm -hmm. And Minachi was like, Mia, that's a very white definition of reciprocity. Love that. I love yeah. that this person said this to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did too. I really mm -hmm. value the way that they just are, are they are that clear all mm -hmm. the time. Um, and then the way that they reframed it for me is much, it's like, I don't know how to describe, it's a non-hierarchical like flow of energy of resources of like yeah. symbiosis yeah. with your environment, your community with yeah. individuals and with yourself. And that feels like the same energy or the same, um, the same way that you're talking about honor, duty and loyalty. It's like in this flow as opposed to like a, I do this, you do that. Per, me, per, precisely. <laughs> precisely and there's like um this theory in the marriage and family therapy world called narrative therapy and I think that you might really like like some of the pieces from that they do lots mm. of like um languaging around like restoring narratives and Ooh. like um doing like re-examinations of like past experiences and like restoring what impact that that had and like kind of like looking at like what beliefs were associated with those past things and like how they may inform current things um and storytelling is like a really big piece of like um, the work that I do as a human yes me um, too. and so yeah like narrative therapy really resonates uh with the kind of work that I do and I think you might Mm, I'll you check might, it out like it. which is why I was like no those words are cool if like power and control are or right. we not a part of that if like there's there's no hierarchy we're just here trying to be in community with one another and 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 do do well by one another until we die yes yes i love that it's all like it's amazing to me like the ways that like i i seek to horizontalize everything mm -hmm and to mitigate power dynamics throughout my life. Like that's a mm -hmm. huge part of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I love when there's like a new place that that practice can flow. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like I just, you just helped me find one. Yeah, it's gonna be dope. I think it's really gonna like, it's gonna blow your mind. Narrative. Yeah. There, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with um, Judith Butler's book, Giving an Account of Oneself? No it sounds like it's really in line with that idea. Um, I love that book. I, I read it. I would, if you're going to read it, I would read it really slowly. Actually, you know what? I'm realizing it should be on the reading list for that program. Like for right. sure. I'm so surprised that I didn't think to put it on there. Um, 
that book was super formative for me. And I was also, I was reading it. I read it, I started reading it and then I put it down and then I read it in full a year or two later. And I was reading it at a time when I was really into theater and I was studying mm -hmm. acting. And the, it's a, it's something of an ethical philosophy book. It's like Judith Butler's kind of moral. Do you know her work? No, not a lot, no. Okay, so she's like a, a gender theorist philosopher. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote a book called Gender Trouble. I know that name, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, this book was like already several years old when I read it 12 years ago in college. Um, uh, gender Trouble was. Mm -hmm. But giving an account of oneself is is sort of her take on like an ethical philosophy in which we are, this is my interpretation of it. We are each essentially, um, and it's very rooted in, in Hegel and Foucault. Mm -hmm. We are each mirrors for each other. And so our ethical obligation is to do everything that we can to be honest and um, accurate and compassionate mirrors. Yes. Uh, and that the reality of who we are exists between us. Yes. Uh, and between me and you and between me and other, every other person. Yes. Um, so it's, it's very much about subjective reality. And it's about the ways that we create who we are by t giving narratives of ourselves. Through giving accounts of ourselves, we tell people who we are and we also learn who we are. Yes. And we craft who we are. I agree with all of the words that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that work was super Definitely. formative. Cool. Yeah, it, it was super formative for me and especially in a time when I was studying acting, which is essentially your role is to tell other people's stories. And inevitably, through the process of telling other people's stories, you are changed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot of, I, I have some actor folks that I've seen mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's no surprise uh, some of the roles actors choose to, right. to take on or to audition for. There is sometimes lots of like healing that comes along with um, being able to work through some pieces and like embody the role, right? Because we can tell oh. stories, but we can also embody stories. And I think sometimes that like, uh, you can see that in, in, in some actors you're like yo you're really like what did you tap into to do this because this is incredible yep yeah my my major like breakthrough with acting was when I was finally I was in New York and so I was finally studying theater acting which is mm -hmm. so different from acting for the camera um, which is like the majority of what you learn if you live in LA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I was, I was studying with this woman, Sandra Lee. Um, and what I started to find was that the deeper that I went with it, the, the more honest I could be. Yeah. And it was because I was being so present. Like when I was truly in the practice of acting, I was doing my deepest listening yeah, my most, yeah. My most honest reacting. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I was, I was so in the moment. I was so with the other person. Everything else ceases to exist. That, to me, that was like a mindfulness practice. It felt very spiritual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it felt nothing like performing. Mm -hmm. I was not, if I was really acting, I was not trying. I yep. wasn't doing I was just being. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think like even hearing you talk about like the, the, the not doing, you were just being, it is something that I strive to to do in my day to day all the time. Same. Like, I don't want to just live this life and just do things. I want to be able to be as much as I can for as long as I'm here because like life will already force me to do, <laughs> to do a lot of different things that I, I, I either want to do or don't want to do. Do you know what I mean? But like not a lot of, uh, 
places that encourage the opportunity to just be. Yeah. Expectations. Right. And I, I, I'm with you. Like the more that I can reduce the amount of doing, trying, performing that I do in my life, Mm -hmm. the better I feel. And, and I re I'm a firm believer that authenticity is medicine. Mm -hmm. That is the path to healing. Mm -hmm. I'm always striving to find more ways that I can be more authentic Mm -hmm. where I don't even necessarily know that I'm not being authentic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was talking to a friend last night about this idea of authenticity and how like when when we slip out of authenticity into like our shadow side, that's often where we hurt people. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about, because we were like, yeah, I want to strive to be that authentic present self at all times. But the fact of the matter is like my, you know, my like petty 16 year old self, my judgmental teen self is going to pop up. Like they're going to show up and they're going to, and then I'm going to go, Oh fuck. You know, like, I don't know why I said that. Mm -hmm. And that's also where like growth happens out of repair. Trust happens out of repair. Repair is very intimate. And so it's not that I can stop those, those slips out of authenticity from happening entirely. I can do my best, Mm -hmm. but it's almost like, you know, if you, have you ever felt with like a friend or someone in your family that like your shadow side is not welcome? Yes. (laughs) You want to expand on that? (laughs) You can tell, you can tell when you are not allowed to be a human that is not digestible to others Mm -hmm. you can like a part of you has a really great sense right and i think that that happens on a lot of a lot of different relationships with folk be it like family members friends like sometimes where we slip out of like you you call it your authentic self like in um part of the work that i do like with ifs it's like you slip out of being in self energy parts of you will like sit in the seat of consciousness and self instead right so that's like your 16 year old self that's like running the show and like maybe saying something in backlash and then later on another part of you will be like okay like why did I say that like what was happening in that moment um and so yeah like a lot of people are not willing or able to like sit and watch that happen right it feels uncomfortable they don't know what to do with it um they would much rather like either neutrality or or um, self betrayal by like not responding or um, like well, the word obey is popping up, but like yeah, eh, like staying yeah in line like in line yes yeah staying in line and so yeah I have experienced that when you say IFS is that internal family systems yes internal yeah, family okay. systems parts cool. work like, yeah yeah yeah. Love- I had a, a therapist very briefly who was, it was, we just were in working together for this contained moment and mm-hmm. um, she worked with that as well. And it was, it really did resonate for me. Yeah. Um, so also I think what ties into this is like the work that you do and the work that I do, there's a lot of pedestalization of people who do this kind of work. There's a lot of like really high expectations and really high standards yeah. And there's often a power dynamic that other people perceive that I'm not aware of. Yes. And then when I, the experience that I've had over and over is that then when I reveal to them that I am human and I fuck up and I say things that are um, the result of the really oppressive systems that we live in. And I show that I have some anxiety and that I have some shame yeah. and that I have some insecurity. Yeah. It's yeah. like I have fallen from so high, a height that I did not ask to be placed at. And then um, there's like incredible conflict because yeah. it seems like I have the feeling on their end is that I have betrayed them or I have lied to them. I have misled yes. them misled about them. You, them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And my, my experience, how, do you do how do, yeah, how could you, how could you, you should know better is yeah. the thing that yeah. comes up a lot. Um, 
And, and something that I work to reconcile is that, um, you know, I think that there's this binary idea that we have, that there are insecure people and there are confident people. (laughs) (laughs) That giggle. Yeah. That is not my experience. My confidence increases daily and my, my insecurity does not decrease. It's not like a dial that you move. And when you have more of one, you have less of the other. So the insecurities pop up. I have trauma in my life, you know, like, like I had a partner for a number of years who had such bad anxiety and such bad depression that when he was feeling, uh, stress in, Mm -hmm. in that, in, in pretty much any realm, the result would be that he would break up with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then he would come back and he would be like, I'm so sorry. Can we pretend that that never happened? Yeah. Like I was stressed because of this and this and this, you know, he would tell me that he was in love with me. And then like days later be like, I can't even say those words anymore. Yeah. It was fucked up. It was like a huge, I was just constantly getting whiplash. And I look back on that and I'm like, okay, my codependency, my need to please, um, my need to help, uh, mm-hmm. and my bad boundaries were preventing me from saying, this is not okay. I am not going to tolerate this. You can figure out your shit and see if I'm available when you're done. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm, I'm not going to stand mm-hmm. for this anymore because this mm-hmm. is harmful. I didn't do that. So mm-hmm. I obviously participated in this cycle. As a result of this, when I'm dating new people and no matter how like exuberant and, and into it they are, if if they so much as like put a period on the end of a text message, (laughs) like, oh God, (laughs) oh no, are you mad at me? I mean, I'm kidding. I'm exaggerating, but like, it's, it's not far from that where like, if I am in a fragile state, if I've had a stressful day or someone was upset with me at work. Yeah. Or my gut is fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, like if you don't respond to me for a few hours, my brain starts doing this thing of like, oh, you've lost interest. Um, did I say or do something? And I can, both can exist, right? Like that yeah. voice oh is God. there. Absolutely. And then there's, yeah. And then there's the other voice that's like, you know, it's fine. Like you're great. They really like you. Like both of those are happening at the same time. And so part of the needs that I've been working on expressing are like, Hey, I'm feeling super fragile today. Um, can Mm. like, you know, how are you doing? Or like, can I, I, I'm, I have a request for like some reassurance here. Yes. I have a request. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, Mm -hmm. and then when people show up for me, like lovely, it's so lovely. lovely. Yeah. My God. It's so, so wonderful. And I can't believe every time it happens, I'm like, it's so, it's like, it's wonderful. And then at the same time, it's a little bittersweet. Cause I'm like, I wish this weren't such an unfamiliar feeling. Oh my gosh. Right. It's like, oh my (sighs) gosh, baby nuggets. Umu and Mia. What the heck? Mm Breadcrumbs. And it's wild because this is like a global breadcrumb, you know, type of uh, economy. Yeah. A lot of people have a lot of unmet needs, a lot of like (sighs) moments of nourishment from childhood that were not experienced. And so when they are in safe enough relational, um, uh, relationships with people and like their boundaries are respected um they're able to have like autonomy and 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 and, and they're they can consent or not consent to things it's like what is happening and and sometimes like people have really big reactions to that yes really big reactions sometimes you you yeah I've seen folks like create issues in their relationship yeah right like this feels mm, I don't know but I I, this 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 creating this uh issue this conflict feels more natural or my body my nervous system is more used to that because whatever's happening right now like I'm not used to it and they're addicted to the stress hormones oh my of course of course and how could you not be like your neural pathways have really just yeah that over time and so mm-hmm. it's like teaching your body um, to orient to what's happening in like the present moments, like using those cues of safety and like letting those be digested instead of just like the cues of danger. Right. Yeah, the cues of danger are really big. I had a conflict with 
my neighbor recently and what came through so clearly was that she she perceives danger constantly that she mm -hmm. just feels very much out of control of, in her environment mm -hmm. and that very very you know seemingly to me minor comments glances yeah. like you know um, get activated really fast really really fast mm -hmm. Um, and it's interesting too, because my system responds to that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as a cue of danger where like, I then am like, I don't feel safe talking to this person because she feels in danger all the time. And her, what, when she gets triggered, it's like really violent screaming mm -hmm. and really violent, um, like forms of communicate the way that she communicates yeah um so I've, I've just been trying to like witness that and observe that without judgment and and try to feel safe in my home yeah for sure result. for sure and it's like sometimes with those types of experiences it's kind of like acknowledging what's happening relationally and then making adjustments um for safety based off of like things that you have control mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. right and it's like it's not that we're saying this neighbor of yours is a bad person she just gets activated around some things and you get activated around her activation and that's completely fair yeah you're allowed to keep yourself safe and remove yourself from situations that don't feel good right right i also noticed how quickly my brain wants to like label her in ways that legitimize dismissing her entirely for sure, for sure. And that's part of the reason why I said what I said out loud, because I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's really easy to do that. Like, why not? Do you yeah. know what I, mean? I don't feel good and and I have every reason to feel like, you know, not good. And I, this, my brain needs, my brain is gonna maybe make meaning about what I'm looking at and what I'm experiencing. Totally. And that's where that like narrative, that, re that restoring thing kind of comes into play. Like, okay, this is not a woman or a person that's like trying to harm me they are activated by an external thing and I get activated by said external thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. That's like, it's bringing me back to what we were talking about earlier around like the way that the information and the knowledge about how these things work in us is so empowering and can mm -hmm. cause such incredible transformation in terms of like how we witness our own reactions to things and um, you know, people that we're in close proximity to, like when they have reactions, like having that information about how people get triggered and polyvagal theory and all those things yeah. <clears throat> can help me have compassion and sympathy for other people, even when their actions are harming me. For sure. For sure. For sure. And I think like, for me, that's, rooted in like my abolitionist values right like I don't think either of you or any of us deserve to be discarded because like parts of us are being activated or like a shadow self is presenting itself whatever languaging feels like it fits for you right in sure. this context um and so because of that when I see these things I try to create space from like like either emotional space right like in my head I'm like let me distance myself so I can see what what is happening um or I'll remove myself from the situation physical space so I can see what's happening because sometimes when you're in the thing or in proximity to the thing your brain has already shut off and you're you're not able to integrate any new information um your body is just kind of running the show at that point so sometimes I remove myself yeah that takes a lot of um I don't know, the words bouncing around in my head are like restraint, control, discipline. Mm -hmm. But then I'm hearing like a lot of um, that sounds oppressive, you know? It sounds really policey, yeah. It does yeah, sound yeah. really policey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. What would be a word then for like the, like, because it, it feels like restraint in a, maybe we just need to redefine those words right? Maybe part of it is redefining those words, part of it for sure. And then I think like, um, 
it's tough to figure out languaging um, as it relates to like supporting oneself. Right. Because those words that we, that you just use, it's like, there's an external force. That's what it sounds like. In, imposing something to do something. We're like um, in, in IFS land, right? Like that's what you described, like being able to move out of and, and do something different is I would describe as like self energy when you're able Ooh. to like be in, in self energy. Right. And that's the, the, the self that's like the Mia that I'm talking to right now. Right. Like the Mia that's grounded, the Mia that's, that's like able to, to engage in dialogue, the Mia that like notices sensations and like, is like, Oh, this is coming up for me. Maybe now I'll say mm. this thing out loud. Right. The Mia that's like not reacting is responding. It's the ventral vagal state of social connection. Boom. And that is self energy. That's we, really cool. When we can sit in self energy and that ventral vagal safety connection, you know, jazz. Right. right? And we're <laughs> able to really, <laughs> then we're able to really honor self and honor whatever other thing is happening. Yeah. So as you've been describing this, new words are coming to mind like agency autonomy yep. feeling like self-possessed yes yep 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 yeah I do think you know I have a, a friend from college who wrote his thesis about how his his belief was that restraint is a form of or a manifestation of wisdom and I I think about that in the word restraint and I feel like there's the policey way and then there's that way. Yeah. And I think that there's res restraint in like, you know, if we're talking about this conflict that I just had, like the restraint is wise because it allows me to slow down. It allows me to find my footing and to, de you know, calm down from that activated state. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I didn't do as good of a job as of that as I could have. Yep. Um, so I like thinking about restraint that I use as like a tool. Yes. You know, I love that. Like as a power I that I that. have. I love that. As a as opposed to like a coercive force I love from that. outside. And I, I, in addition to all that you just said, I think I'm I. I think that I'm cool with words, right? But what I need to know is the person that's using the words, mm -hmm. what they think of policing and disposability and discarding, right? Mm. Because then the word restraint doesn't mean as scary of a thing. Totally. Restraint totally. is so important, but like restraint to whom? Whom is restraining and why is the restraining? And you know what I mean? Like then there, all of those like nuance pieces come up, but like restraint is so, so, so important. But like, I'm also not going to tell that to a predator. Right. Right. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I'm going to talk to the predator about some other things and then also like figure out other languaging and yada, yada until we get to a place where yes. like, this is a person that's able to be responsible with these words. Right. Right. That's really interesting. Cause I'm also thinking about like the flip side where like, I'm not in a healing space, like in a private session or in a class where someone shares with me, for example, that they've been incarcerated. Like I'm not going to use words like control, yeah. um, restraint, discipline, um, because those are going to have really intense connotations mm -hmm. about oppressive force. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and even, even before removing those words, I would even ask the, like the person, like, what do you think of these words when I use them? Yes. Especially depending on the body that's situated, that's using those words. Right. And like what my relation to said system is. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I love that. You know, when you said abolition, that like the way that we were talking about this was like in line with your abolitionist thinking that resonated so deeply. And I was also really struck by like the way that you were talking about the same thing, the conflict um, or conflict in general, like what came up for me was this ongoing theme in my life of non-binary thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. And moving away from, um, 
from the idea that you ever only have two options. And the way that that manifests in this conflict is that there is someone doing harm and there is someone being harmed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an abuser and an abused. There's a, you know, a victim, like a perpetrator and a victim. Yeah, and even when I used the word predator, I was like, oh, I hate that word. I I read it immediately. Yeah, I almost mentioned it when you said that because I was like, that's so interest yeah go ahead yeah 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 as and and right like my my (laughs) people in my life will be like yeah if something that we know about it's like the precision of language right Mm. like when I'm talking I try to be very very specific in the words that I choose and the the type of gendered languaging that I'm using and then even even the binary languaging that I use right because there's so much nuance and gray like that black and white thinking serves no one in the process and it doesn't like um i think allow us to uh really value the wide range of human experiencing and and like how really wild it is to grow up without a manual <laughs> isn't it i know like, it's, it's, really wild. it's true and we like apply that manual list <laughs> concept to so many things in our lives like sex being the glaring one like yeah yeah, you should just know how to do that but I want to something that you said about it was the precision of language what what did you say right before the thing about the manual oh black and white thinking and Mm -hmm. non-binary thought Mm -hmm. um and gendered languaging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, my my colleague, the one who came up with or uses the phrase like being in consent, that's Marianne yeah. George. They run the Kindling Kind. Um, oh, oh my gosh, I love their page. Oh, cool. I'm so glad. That's so, f- I love that. Yes. Um, yeah, so the, I just did a class with them and then we were talking about teaching together. And one of the ideas that I had was to teach a class on non-binary thinking beyond the gender binary so that it's like um all these ideas of like black and white good and evil uh predator victim like police and policed yes you know like yes because as you said that kind of thinking is not serving anybody whenever we say either this or that we're missing the most Mm -hmm. like the rest of the iceberg you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm I'm interested in like teaching this class that's more like philosophy theoretical yeah. type of thing. Um, so I'm excited to do that. With yeah, them. and I think anyway. like what you're saying, um, it really allows for like more spaciousness in in everything. Totally. In everything, the things that we do, the way that we interact um, and everything. So yeah, I like it, it sounds great. I've been noticing the way that like, as I watch, I've been watching TV shows that I was watching as a child or that like came out when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, Like I recently watched the entire series of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah. yeah. Which was like way too much TV. Like I was watching, that was absurd. That was a moment where I'm looking back and I'm like, why were you watching that much television? A part of you really needed that. I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also just rewatched the entire OC. Yeah. Um, And and now I'm watching Buffy, which I had never seen as a kid, but- Did you watch I'm... Angel? <clears throat> no. I watched Angel. I didn't do the Buffy okay. thing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm finally now watching Buffy. And <clears throat> what I'm noticing more and more as I explore my gender is that when I'm watching these things, the way that I used to watch them is that I would look at the, I would look at the women, char- the female characters, mm-hmm. and I would go, like, okay, so these are my options of how to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I would look at the male characters and I would go, I'm not supposed to do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then I would get really conflicted when there were things that the boys were doing. And I was like, but I want to do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So <clears throat> the reason I bring this up is that I, I'm now returning to these things and and looking at them with so much more curiosity and room to play because I'm no longer looking at it as a one or the other set of options yeah yeah it's so much more interesting and your gender deserves to have as much spaciousness as you as you would like 
Yeah. For reals. For reals. I agree. That's hot. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And that's that's also like it reminds me of like the whole when I said I'm an umu thing. Yes. Yeah. A lot of my the people that I see in therapy, a lot of them sometimes when they'll describe me to like their friends or whatever, they tell them how they just describe me as like like an umu. <laughs> there is, you know, umu. And mm -hmm. uh, they use she and they pronouns because words, gender, like, you know, it's yeah, words have meaning and words are like words are embodied. I do these exercises where I tell you, you have just say no, like no matter what I ask you, just say no. And it's amazing. I love that. Yeah, I'm going to be teaching that in the program too, so that everyone knows how to use these exercises that like build on each other. Mm -hmm. And what always stuns me is that even when it is scripted, even when it's something as silly as like, can I poke your nose? Saying no elicits a response in your body because it is emotionally charged. Words are charged. Like words yeah. are not neutral. No, no, no. And that's why that precision of languaging shit is really important to me. I think I saw that in The Giver, like that, th those words specifically. I read that book in middle school and watched the movie at some point in my life. And one of their values was precision of language. And I think I just like, mm. my Virgo brain was like, I like that. <laughs> I like that too. I think precision of language is so important. I think it's really important. Yeah. It's really, really important. Well, yeah. I'm conscious of time. And so if you're ready, I'll ask you my wrap up question. Love it. I think okay. I know what you're about to ask me, go. Okay, so I am curious about your three most um, formative influences, and they can be literally anything from your life. I love that. Um, my three most formative influences. I think that one of them is it's bell hooks. Mm -hmm. Bell hooks, for sure. I think another one is maybe I'll do bell hook slash like Asada Shakur. Okay. I like the both of them a lot. A second one is James Baldwin. Yeah. And then a third one. It's like, I don't want to say it's kind of dark, but I think like this happening so much really, um, grounds me um in the things that i believe and so the third one i would say is like it's, it just feels so wild to say out loud the death of like the children by police hands the black mm. the black children it's so, like i think of like tamir rice a lot a lot i think about him um and so yeah, i think about him a lot that shit really blew my mind mm. It really blew my mind. And so, yeah, I think that's like a third, a third influence, um, influence that like has been more recent and more, you know, more recent years of my life, but definitely huge. Yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't even know how to write that in a sentence. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I wrote down what you said, the death of black children at police hands. Yeah. That shit is wild. That shit is wild. That shit is wild. And there's so many things wrapped up in that. And I think like, it just really, again, grounds me in my abolitionist values, right? And the way that I engage with others because I don't think anyone, and I know no one deserves to be policed like that and at, at that scale either. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that you said Bell Hooks and James Baldwin and my interpretation of the fact that you didn't say a specific work is that it's like them as thinkers. Yes, yeah. Oh. Absolutely, absolutely. I think their ab Im the the ability to think imaginatively, right, and and think of even like Octavia Butler blows my fucking mind. Yeah. I think that would be like another influence. You know what I mean? Like them as thinkers for sure. I wouldn't choose a work. I also find that difficult. Like if somebody's like your top three favorite whatever's, I'm like I always shut down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Depends yeah. on the day. Yeah, literally. Like. Yeah, I agree. Gosh, Uma, this was great. Agreed. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Mia. Yeah. Wow.
Woo! <laughs> we did it. All right, I'll stop recording.